Hi, I'm Deborah Herman, and I'm with Diane Lake. We collaborated on the book Member of the Family, which was Diane's memoir of her story. Literally, it's called My, My Story of Charles Manson, Life Inside His Cult, and the Darkness That Ended the 60s. Yesterday, in the news, we all learned that Leslie Van Houten, um, one of the people involved in the crimes um, and who was a member of the Manson family back when, was actually paroled. And she had been paroled before, but this time they actually let her out and approved her parole. So immediately you were given contacts by many media outlets asking you to comment and you chose not to comment. So I guess I guess the reason we're having this conversation now is to talk about your not comment um, and why you chose not to comment about, um, I'm gonna get sick of that word, why you chose not to make a statement regarding Leslie Van Houten's release. Well, it was a very long time ago that I knew her. The last contact I had with her was uh, at her second trial. And I've had no contact with her since then. So I, I don't, I don't, you know, really know who she is anymore. Um, it was very healing for me to write the book and tell my ex my experience with the family. I had hid it for a very long time because I was very, very ashamed and didn't want to have any association with it. So my experience was healing to talk about and hopefully it provides a cautionary tale for others that may be caught up in a cult. We didn't call it a cult at that time, of course. It was just another commune. And so um, it, and the subject matter of her being released is very controversial. <laughs> and I really don't. I saw, I was, re that's another interesting point about all of this. People have so many controversial or or differing opinions about whether she should be let out, whether she should stay in. And it just raises the point to me of how this crime and Charles Manson and the family is still so much a part of the uh, uh, world consciousness, but specifically American consciousness. It's as if it happened yesterday in many people's minds. How yes, it was a, a, a huge event in history. Uh, you know, it came at the height really of the summer of love. Woodstock was happening. All kinds of things were happening in 69. And um, it kind of uh, punctured the bubble of free love and, you know, psychedelic drugs and all of that. I mean, these the people's worst fears were realized. Yeah. With, what, what with the event of th these murders. Yeah. You could, it was like the world was one way. There are several events that happen in, in our um, joint experience uh, as human beings and also as, as Americans. And it seems that that was an event that in our, our timeline was so significant that truly the world changed after after those two days in August of, of 1969. How do you account for that? And, and well, certainly it was still very vivid in, in your personal experience. Yes, it it was. And for for kids that were, you know, like around 10, you know, pre pre-teens, Charlie became the boogeyman. He was the, you know, he was the monster under the bed. He was the, you know, for the for the paper boys getting their papers at, you know, pre-dawn, 
uh, you know, if they heard anything, somebody was following him. It was, you know, in a lot of cases, not, not every case, of course, but, you know, I have heard per personal stories that Charlie was the boogeyman and he was the one chasing him, you know, down the street. So I have a was very... in jail. <laughs> okay. You're not going to believe this. The other day I went to my local library sale, which I love. And I, now I never mentioned the writing of this book with you. I never mentioned, you know, the fact that I am now a de facto cult expert working on other projects, nothing. All I did was mention that I had just come back from LA and a woman who was volunteering at the sales said, well, I have never been to California, but I think I will go now that I know Charles Manson is dead. What? I am not kidding you. And I'm like, that's crazy. Okay. So see, that, had, that's a perfect see? example. Yep. And and it's 55 years ago. Yes. So or longer. Let's see. Yes. Yeah. And so it put this this whole energy around the state of California. And that's why, you know, we're, that's why it's very understandable that you would not have an opinion or want to share an opinion based on the now, because your experience was then. And I, I also, you've, you've written in you, in your memoir, member of the family about your experiences of what it was like back then and for you wasn't it like just joining any other commune tell us how you wound up there in the first place i'm sure people are curious about that who haven't read the book and they should if they have not <laughs> yeah so try to make it quick um you know my my parents bought into the whole timothy leary uh turn on tune in and drop out and that's what they did they dropped out and, you know, we moved into a, like, a uh, step van, a small step, you know, like a UPS step van that uh, had been converted converted into a, a camper. Well, there's, you know, I was the oldest of three children, so there's five of us in a very small space. And I really um, was uncomfortable. And, you know, I was a teenager. I was 14 and, you know. But that so, was not that crazy uncommon back then. People were looking for alternative lifestyles. Right. So you weren't like the only person in the planet yeah, it, whose it, family it, was it, living it, in it a was, van. It was happening. There was lots of people in buses and vans and, you know, living on the beach and all of that. And so my parents ended up in, you know, the hog farm which is a, you know, relatively famous, has become a relatively famous commune. But I, and I was kind of an anomaly in that I was a teenager. Uh, my parents were older, older hippies or kind of fell, be, you know, most of the kids in the communes were toddlers, babies, you know, maybe up to 10, but not a 14 year old girl who was sexually active. And so I was not really, you know, welcome there. I didn't feel well. Which was also not that uncommon for kids at 14, 15 back then. I want to make that clear. This was a very different era. And people were experimenting with alternative lifestyles and free love. You know, it wasn't like, I, I just want to make that clear because people need to look at your story and your book through the lens of, of the times yeah oh for sure and so uh another couple came up and i went to live with them for a few weeks and they took me to the spiral staircase house for a party and that's where i met charlie and the girls and what was so amazing is when i walked in they already knew me it was like well i'd never met them before well it turns out charlie had was known as Black Bus Charlie back then, visited the hog farm and he met my parents and he let them know that he was going to be going to San Francisco and that's where I was. I was in San Francisco. And so, you know, they gave my mom gave him my picture and said, you know, I, I'm not we're not sure exactly what she did say, but something to the effect of, you know, here's a picture of my daughter. If you see her, say hi, bring her home, you know, whatever. <laughs> 
you and know, so again, they, already, they already knew who I was and I felt really, you know, uh, love bombed is, you know, I felt- There were so many mystical things happening back then. You know, people were looking for the magic and, and from what you've told me in, in our research together and writing the book, uh, he- Man, Charles Manson presented himself as like a Pied Piper. He was very mystical, magical, bigger than life, impish, you know, and yeah, he kind of looked like a lot of you other know, people. He, guitar had, playing, you know, long hair. Yeah. He played the guitar. He wrote songs, you know, he just fit right in with the whole hippie culture. <laughs> and and his psychobabble kind of philosophy was very fitting with the times and and you know if you're a seeker and you're young it's like wow you know it was very profound and yeah you know and it was great and he so, kind of wove it all together and so yeah. you know and and for somebody that's young and naive and they don't you know they haven't this is all brand new right relatively you know i mean bible uh Scientology you know Satan and all of that you know it's just like he kind of wove it all together and I'm sure he didn't even know <laughs> I don't think he even believed one thing or the other <laughs> he just yeah it was sort it of like together to it mesmerize became a, us yeah it became yeah. a minestrone suit although although I think again focusing on Manson, you know, as we progressed in the research and the writing of the book, I think we did come to the conclusion that he was believing in his own, um, he had a messianic uh, personality. So he was believing in his, eventually in his own superiority. Yeah, I, I, I think definitely that it, it, it became that way. But I think in the beginning, it was just it was fun and games stuff that he'd stuff that he'd heard you know in and fit in with the hippie free love guru so line of thinking so because, it's just he started to believe it himself i think and and he, he i think in the book we you know we talk about he had a LSD trip that gave him a um a crucifixion experience but there there's a lot of unpacking of I mean it was several years of a lot of experiences and we've we've really covered that um but I think people are curious at least about uh, not how you I'm sure they'd love to know how you feel now but again it's irrelevant to you but when did you first meet Leslie Van Houten back then 55 some odd years ago do you remember first meeting her? I, I, I think I first met Leslie at Spawn Ranch. Um, I can't remember this at this point. I can't remember the specific, you know, incident. But you have to read your book. I'll have to read it again. Yes, no, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> it was not, it, it wasn't clear exactly when um i'm sure there are, there are factual accounts of exactly when she joined but she was then there as one of the girls and um you have memory of her but i i'd like to skip ahead actually um to i i'm going to actually read well you were in death valley away from the others before you knew about the crimes. You were not part of the crimes. And in fact, you were never asked to participate. But when you got to Olancha, which is at the foot of Death Death Valley going up to Barker Ranch. It it's you, it's a gate it's a gateway to Death Valley off of the 395. And you reunited with Tex Watson. What happened? Because at this point, you don't even know why you were sent back to Barker Ranch. You don't know what's happened. You just know that that the energy had shifted. And and you had, as you testified, you had seen 
Leslie burns you may want to mention that you burned some things after she got right back. yeah well I was still at um not Barker Ranch but at Spawn um, Ranch and Leslie I woke up to Leslie burning some stuff in the fireplace and then a car came down the the road she says oh don't let those people see me you know they just gave me a ride from Griffith Park and so you know I went to the door and I you know made up whatever you know no nobody's here and and they eventually left and then I think she continued burning her stuff and she gave me a bag of coins and and then later that afternoon I was whisked off to Olancha uh, along with with another kid and which was not really that unusual because we often you know or we had definitely met at this little ranch in Olancha so that when everybody got together, then we would caravan together to go to the foot of Golar Wash because you knew it, which was like the, the gateway to Barker Ranch. And so you needed uh, quite a few people really to move rocks and plywood and whatever uh, to get some of the vehicles. I've been there with you. <laughs> right. So you, I will you never forget when we were almost lost trying to find Barker Ranch. Oh my god. I don't think what anybody realizes adventure. what this is. I don't think people realize what this place is like. Yeah. And no. going up those the the hills and yeah, that is that is yeah. I could see why you would need a lot of people. So it's right. so like I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't else. really I wasn't really surprised by that. But uh then I actually, you know, I was out you know, on the highway, you know, at this little roadside store and gas station looking for food. And I got, I got picked up by the sheriff, you know, for being a runaway or whatever. Anyway, they, so they took me to the, the station, you know, in Inyo County and I had been arrested in Ventura with my, with a fake ID. And back then there was no digital, you know, <laughs> communication so they called them and yes they had arrested me and you know the name I gave and and I I was of age and so they in your you fake know, ID in my fake ID I was yeah. yes I was of age and that's the name I gave them of course and so you know the sheriff took me home to his house treated my sunburn I took a shower spent the night they gave me clothes hat some money took me back to and little did you know Took me back to, you know, the little roadside place in Atlanta where they where he picked me up and I found my way back and and Tex is frantic, you know, where have you been? And he had a newspaper that talked about these, you know, Tate LaBianca murders that were happened in LA. And he slaps the newspaper and says, I did this. Charlie told me to. And wow. I was just like I was just shell shocked. I was just what? I I just couldn't I just couldn't believe it. And then now, now I can't leave now. I can't run away now. So it was uh, you know, and then shortly after the rest of the gang showed up in the dune buggies and the, you know, trucks and and we went to Death Valley. Well, up to Barker Ranch. You at that point knew about Texas involvement and you knew about the crimes. In in the book, it, you talk about the actual moment when the women were sharing with you what happened. And I, I would actually like to read a couple of paragraphs if that's yeah, that's fine. Because um, just to give people an understanding. So you're now in Death Valley. Okay, you've been hiding um, by, uh, I think you were in Willow Springs, which is about uh, 10 miles from Barker. And um, it was late September when Charlie went with a few of us to explore. A blood red moon rose in the sky as we set out. 
Patty, Leslie, and I were eating some watercress we found in the trickling water while we cleaned up a small house made of stones and wood that had likely once belonged to a miner. It would make a good hideaway if some of us needed to spread out from Barker. I went through the motions of cleaning and fixing up the house and finding food so I would appear busy and engaged. The girls started chattering with each other and then started talking to me. I tried to keep it to small talk because I was already coming undone. Leslie drew the conversation to the night of the slayings of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. You know that night we went to the house near Griffith Park, Leslie looked to Patty and Sadie for affirmation. As if the pump had been primed, Leslie's description of the night bubbled up in a gush. I didn't want to know any more than what I had read in the newspaper or than Tex had revealed, but it was too late. I remained silent as Leslie recounted the second night of the murderous terror orchestrated by Charlie. Later accounts say that Charlie considered the first night too messy, so he would go along to show them how it should be done. Somewhere in the middle of this micromanaging of madness, Charlie left the rest of the job to Tex, Patty, and Leslie. Tex told me what to do, Leslie explained. Leslie paused but surprised me with her reaction. I thought she would say something about how awful it was, but instead she described how strange it was to stab someone, but that after a while it was fun. Rosemary, whom Leslie referred to only as the woman, was still warm, and she may have already been dead when Leslie stabbed her. She couldn't really be sure. Then she was told to wipe the fingerprints off of everything, and she did, removing them from the refrigerator, the lamps, and the doors, even things that they hadn't touched. She told me some other details, like seeing a boat in the driveway, but by this time I had tuned her out. I wished I had not heard her say any of this. I flushed with fear and sadness for the victim as Leslie made it sound like the murder was no big deal. For something that was nothing, it was later determined that Rosemary LaBianca, 39, had been stabbed 41 times. Four days after his 44th birthday, Lino LaBianca had been stabbed at least 26 times. He had no defensive wounds, a fatal wound to the carotid artery, and the word war carved into his stomach. A fork had been stabbed into his flesh as if he were a suckling pig. Patty later claimed responsibility for those special touches, as well as leaving the misspelled words, helter-skelter, on the refrigerator door in Lino's blood. Patty and Leslie said they took some chocolate milk and hitchhiked home. Uh-huh. I nodded my head, but couldn't say anything more. The girls continued to compare notes, like teenage girls discussing makeup and the boys they liked at school. I slowed my breathing so my face would not betray my emotions. Charlie told us to do something witchy, and we did, Patty said proudly. I stared at them, speechless and shocked but doing my best not to reveal my feelings. I remember looking up at the eerie moon, haunting with its presence as a stray feather floated by in the sky. When Tex had told me about the crimes by pointing to the headline, it had been an abstraction, disturbing of course, but the absence of detail had put distance into the story. These girls showed me just how real it was. I'm sorry I had to remind you. It's very, very painful. It is. It really is. It just makes me want to, makes me cry. I just. And that's why. Writing the book was very, was very cathartic to, to get that out. But I still, you know. It's sad. And... It's so, it's so sad. And I mean, my over. You know, my overriding memory was that they were like gleeful about it. I mean, you know, they were they were proud of themselves. And I, you know, I I feel so bad. I mean, that just shows you how 
taken with Charlie and and Tex, they were, you know, and and Tex with Charlie that they that they could that they had that mindset to do that. It's it. I just it just. It tears me up again, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> now I know why like, I haven't like, reread it. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, I do because that you. was like what seven years ago now, and, and you know, You're I'm six. seventy. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm just so grateful that you shared your story, and again, this isn't a political matter. The law is the law. But lest people forget that this was a very real tragedy. And, you know, one thing I know that you also said to me is they're not doing her any favors because if you were in prison for 50 years and you came out into this world. Oh, she's it's going to be a, a really steep learning curve. I mean, <laughs> It, just it's almost a punishment. Computer, just the computer world alone. I mean, it has, if you don't use it every day, you lose contact with how did, you know, even cutting and pasting can be difficult, you know, if you haven't really done it for a while. I mean, I'm, I'm much, I, I can do things on my phone that I cannot do on my computer just because I don't use my computer but it's a whole different think about way. I yeah. mean it's easier for me to print stuff off my phone than it is off my computer think about ah. between 1969 to 2023 the change oh my god ah. 1969 we didn't have phone answering machines right you had to sit by the the phone if somebody was going to call you Right? Do you right. remember? Right, right. You had to stay home all day. I don't think they had beepers. I don't think we no. even had beepers then, we right? We did not have yeah. any of that. Walkie-talkies. Yes. <laughs> yes, there were walkie. You know that. Walkie-talkies. We didn't have, uh, you know, I mean, there were computers that were starting, but they took up an entire room. And now we, now this is a computer. I mean, oh, totally. Yeah. And somebody said that that they know that she hasn't ever used an ATM machine. I mean, I just think that somehow it's 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 like someone being in a coma for a very long time. Yeah, I'm I, I, I'm I sure in prison that. that they had access to salt. You know, they have. Yeah. They maybe they did. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure computers and you know, because people have gotten law degrees. I don't know anybody in the Manson family; they got a law degree or whatever. But people have gone to prison and you know, come out with various degrees and stuff. So it'll it'll be it'll be interesting to see what she does with her life now. Well, we will very likely not know, except what appears in in if anybody you know interviews her or whatever. But I do appreciate why you did not want to comment um, because this was a, a time and a place. It greatly affected your life. Um, you never expected that this would hang over your life for so many years. I mean, you didn't even tell your children until you had to, you know, 30 some odd years later. 35 years right. later, whatever. Um, yeah. So I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm sorry I had to bring up those those painful feelings again. Um, but as always, I appreciate how brave you are. You've made a, a wonderful life for yourself. Um, and you're so open. And you're, um, you know, you're my hero. <laughs> I have been I have been very blessed and and I I give all the glory to God for yeah. getting me through uh, the the perseverance the joy I mean you know I, I I'm thankful for you know being a foster child I'm I'm thankful that they sent me to a state hospital you yeah. know where I was able to 
you know, regain my sanity, you yeah. know, and, and, and deprogram just, and get off the and, drugs and being just being totally away from communes and all of that, you know, I just, if, if that was a blessing, got taken in by a foster family, you know, I ended up going to Europe for two years and you're I just, alive and you're contributing married children yes. grandchildren <laughs> i know and you taught no. special ed children and it's really it's a blessing but you were a witness to something very historic and your book and your story is still a cautionary tale because to this very day there are uh, there are cults. There are people who give away their identity, and it's a it's a pattern that keeps happening. And and and, uh, and there's still lots of people out there that prey on naive young women, yeah, or especially girls and boys, and you know they have no qualms about manipulating them to, to do their own deeds you know good bad or whatever i mean they just it's not people uh, we use people we need to i hope that people continue to to raise the um the vibration um in our world for good and through prayer whatever people believe we don't dictate but to be able to see through um, these false prophets and to maintain their own identity and to live their lives fully with love and um, to prevent these horrible tragedies from happening. Do you have yeah. any final words? No, thank you for thinking. Thank you for helping me through this, you know, new aspect of the story because yeah. it's it is it is very it is it is difficult to to navigate and negotiate with the feelings and it you brings know, it not all just up again. mine but but everybody's i mean it's yes. a historical uh you know it rips off the the it rips off band-aid and the wound and the scab makes us think about it all over again but there must be yeah. a purpose and if that purpose is to remember and never forget the victims and to avoid um, these tragic situations in the future, then it serves a purpose. Yeah, yeah. Well, blessings. you know, I mean, we really have to look at, you know, we have to look at the positive, Yeah. you know, and um, yeah, and, and just keep enlightening people of the bad things in the world that we need to be prepared to deal with <laughs> somehow you are you are truly an example of someone who has um you know triumphed reclaim reclaimed your identity and survived and again um i thank you uh we will be we'll post this and i hope people share it and this is your comment of a non-comment um, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. All right. I, I want Thanks. you to have the final word. <laughs> well, thank you for allowing me to address my no comment status. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it's, you know, it's, it's very. It was thought out. It wasn't just a flippant yeah. decision. You thought, you thought about it. So again, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Diane. Okay.